Uh, according to HubSpot's most recent State of Marketing report, the top challenges around marketing strategy include facilitating sales and marketing alignment, hiring top talent, knowing the social issues your audience cares about, creating content that generates leads, and gaining and keeping the followers on social media. Now, I did a bit of legwork and found that these challenges are further supported by uh, other surveys, which, uh, and, and one in particular, which also found that 26% of companies agree that their top marketing challenge is to keep up with the latest trends. Now, I wonder with all this if there's a more fundamental question to be asked. Are marketers able to effectively build strategic systems for long term growth? And if not, how can we shift our mindset from viewing marketing as a series of short-term tactics to approaching it as a strategic system for long-term growth, similar to how we manage other aspects of our business? I'm hoping a guest will share his perspectives and insights in just a moment. But first, hello and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast, brought to you by Sproutworth.com. I'm Vinay Koshi, and our guest is Kurt Euler. Now, Kurt, you're a globally recognized 10x marketer, operator, and speaker. You've built and run early stage companies as well as those over $500 million in annual revenue, assembled teams across six continents, been part of the small team leading an IPO of about $880 million, and participated in dozens of acquisitions. Uh, I would say your unique experience has built you uh, as the king of scaling businesses and expert on achieving high sorry, expert on high achieving, servant leadership. I could go on, it's a pretty glowing resume, but uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt, I'm curious, was there a particular incident or event that uh, brought the realization of you being really good at scaling businesses? Uh, yeah, I had an unexpected mentor, but a, a very well-known name by a gentleman named Judson Green. He was the former CFO of Disney as a whole, the president of Disney theme parks. And he, he thought he was retiring and joined this little company called Navtech that I it was my first job out of my master's degree with. And uh, I was one of 10 people that he reached out to, to know what was going on in the organization. And I was on the business side. And because I was so good on the business side, some opportunities came up for me to start being given marketing things. And here I had a senior former executive out of Disney that he kept giving me these Disney projects while saying, Hey, don't tell your boss, keep working on these other things. And it would do well with one. So he would give me two or three more. And then, like, Hey, don't tell them that, but I need you to go to the Paris office and, and work on this project over there. And Judson really helped to guide me towards taking business insights into marketing in this way that I didn't know. I didn't know what was happening at the time, but I would have to say I got pulled into marketing thanks to a mentor. Given your journey to date, what would you say would be your personal area of strength? My personal area of strength, I see how things things relate in terms of systems and how things are going to come together. I'm almost always in B2B, which is near and dear to, to your heart, mm -hmm. but I'm really industry agnostic. And I think the top performing marketers really are. The more mm -hmm. complex the sale, the more complex the technology, that includes highly regulated industries or not. That's where I do really well. And I'm not sure, exactly sure why, but I'm able to see how all these pieces relate and I make very good friends with the product team and the chief financial officers at these companies. They're always looking at terms of risk and how do they invest. And so how do you take very complex B2B sales environments and distill it down so that you can trigger emotions and still check all the factual boxes to get people to buy? And in that area of strength, I think you've already answered it, but I'll ask if you could elaborate a little bit more. In that area of strength, is there something that businesses don't know but should. Yeah, I think for me, the bi big part about the business, from the business standpoint, and I think what the marketers need to know is a little bit different. From the business standpoint, businesses have really, we've for the last maybe 15 years or so, we've been able to look at last click attribution. Pay per click is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love pay per click. We, as marketers, we know that the cookie list future is upon us now. But so often, chief financial officers, CEOs, they've gotten used to thinking that they know what's driving sales, where to me, I think what the CEOs and the financial officers don't often know is, yeah, the marketers, we can give them a report that says, hey, here's where the pay-per-click ads have turned over the last 10 years. But I think the marketers that have done this really well and they've thought about contribution and building brand and content, Google's really good at one thing. 
And that is knowing where people are at in the funnel. So I've done this experiment at a B2B SaaS company. I've taken $300,000 a month of advertising spend and I've dialed it down to $10,000 for an entire quarter. And I saw sales almost not change. And so I was like, to me, that means that Google has been taking a huge bit of credit for sales that we as marketers and sales teams were driving already, but yet it still justifies some of the budget to the CFO. Mm -hmm. I guess one of, one of the challenges that uh, a lot of marketers face is this uh, need for attribution and, and numbers uh, in order to appease the, the leadership in, in companies. <clears throat> it's easy to use something like pay-per-click to attribute uh, sales, uh, as you just mentioned. Is there perhaps a lack of awareness of the power of branding? and uh, some of the other intangibles that go into building uh, a business that leaders sh should be comfortable with uh, as opposed to seeking numbers all the time? V very much so. I'm, I've always been much more of a fan and, and I think we're going to see this is where top performing marketers are moving already, but they were, we're, everybody's going to be forced to it in the next five mm -hmm. to eight years is contribution, not attribution. I've done really well with discussing and being on the same page with my sales teams and the product teams by acknowledging, hey, like I never want to be in a situation where we close a big deal and the salesperson takes credit by saying, hey, yeah, but I played golf with the, that decision maker two years ago. Did that contribute? Yes. Was that the sole reason? No. But that I've seen those discussions happen and mm -hmm. shift things. I think the biggest thing for, for the contribution versus attribution is having discussions with across the entire company and not just in marketing, but about talking in terms of time horizons. And so it's also how you get the CFOs to end up being your friends as well. Is so mm -hmm. now, now it's hard because so many CEOs, as we mentioned, are they're, they're used to seeing this attribution model, but but product never builds things just for this month or this quarter, or they shouldn't. Product should never be, be building things that the sales team just promised as a feature that product team should be approaching things in a short term, medium term, maybe a two year to three year time frame and a longer time frame. If you're going to have a major product architecture redesign, like you need to plan that in. That's going to be a huge effort. Marketing is very much the same way as you mentioned brand building. I can't just start a brand like that. I can't just get a bunch of influencers in a B2B market. I have to craft those relationships. I have to find out what the person's actually doing and not just like how much budget they have, what's the budget line item called? You don't just get that relationship where they'll tell you that in, in, in a five minute call. You, you have to do that over time and create a safe environment. But when you start shifting the conversation with your CEOs and CFOs to talking about the short-term, medium-term, long-term goals, now they start, they're opened up to the contribution concept that much more. And it fits in with the revenue side. It takes, they love it because it takes the conversation for customer success and pulls back the reins a little bit that says we need to do this right and not just try to hit a quarterly number from a customer success perspective as well. But I do think that pendulum is, it's been shifting a little bit from the top performing side, but mm -hmm. I think we're going to see it shift way more towards contribution over the next five to eight years. That's probably the, the biggest thing. For those of us who perhaps <clears throat> find that it, it makes sense at a higher level, but struggle with the fact that we could be spending tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, into projects that seemingly are meant to contribute towards the overall branding and marketing effort, but could, without the right checks and balances and metrics, go down the gurgler, so to speak. What would you suggest to them? Yeah, great question. I, I think it starts with your marketing team as well. Um, so often I'll come into a B2B organization and, and, and even if they only have maybe five people on their whole marketing team or those that have 500 and I go and ask the individual contributors, can you tell me just within marketing, forgetting the rest of the company, how is what you've been tasked with doing? How is that, how is that helping the team and the company hit its outcomes? And you get these blank stares or you get a response because people feel that they need to answer something but they don't truly understand how the system works across marketing, much less the company. And I'm a big believer and marketers, mark, a lot of marketers don't like to do this, but it's you have to train your team on a systems mindset about how this drip campaign is going to merge with other things. And it matters much more in B2B than it actually does in B2C. And on the B2C side, support still matters. But when I go into most B2B companies, especially like on the SaaS side, if you look at content as an example, the content that's used to gain a customer, traditional marketing, 
product marketing, and then content, which often get often usually gets relegated to customer success, but that onboarding training support, if you go in and really audit the type, the, the types of content, the actual specific information, there's an 85 to 95% overlap between those three areas. So who should be creating that? If, if there's a 95% overlap between content that the customer success team is taking to grow accounts and train accounts, as well as for parts of the funnel marketing that marketing typically does, those are usually just disparate. But but if one if everybody understands a the system, then one person, usually the CMO, can help to quarterback and run that entire content map, regardless of who who creates it, mm-hmm. and then just figure out how to repurpose it. When you do that, it changes the conversation with the finance team because we have a content plan, but product is creating some of it. We have a content team, but customer success that might be under sales is creating some of it. And now we start to get talking, we start to talk about leading indicators. And to your point, like, how do you know if you're going down the right trail? Well, I've, one of the things I've, I have a really good way of getting capital and investment from the CFOs for something that most marketers struggle with, SEO efforts. Mm -hmm. It's because I go to them and say, look, you want sales. You want visitors to the website filling things out. And they're like, yeah, that's what we want. And so I explain to them and I'm like, look, you want to rank first, second, or third in Google? They're like, absolutely. I'm like, great. I need X dollars. And they're like, and I'm like, in over like 24 months, and they start freaking out. I'm like, here's how this works. And I was like, I can show you that, confirm we're following the right, or making the right path. Because you'll never rank third until you've ranked 13th and 37th and 97th even for keywords. Mm -hmm. And they go, but I I don't want to rank 97th. And I was like, but that's how Google typically works. And I was like, so we're going to put together something that you're going to see trailing numbers for us every month. So on this investment, we're going to track things from the content perspective that says, look, the one ground truth I can say is impressions from Google Search Console. I can't lie about that number. You can log in and see it yourself. And I was like, now the third party tools, they make it up. What's a ranking? And I was like, but I will always show you on our non-brand keywords because I want to boost their brand, but I'm going to show you the top 10, top 20, top 50, and top 100. And I'm going to show you how these rank. And I'm going to, we're going to start in January of 2024. And then I'm going to show you the February numbers. And we're always going to show, as long as I'm here, we will always show you the months from when we started to where we're at. And so that's what we did at eXp Realty. So mm-hmm. it was not a top 10 brokerage at the time. So we had a B2B play that we were building as well as a large consumer play. And we built, ended up building the fourth largest and got investment to build the fourth largest real estate website in the world. And so we took this path and we're able to show and, and make everybody very comfortable that says, look, we're, by the end, we're ranking for 400, 450,000 keywords at some level, one through 100. But we could show how our top 10s were increasing, the top 20s. You see how it doesn't always go up and to the right, like the CFO would often like. But you give them that, that guide up front and for me, the real key for them, and I think for any of the marketers that you know that, that listen, which is most everyone, is you have to agree in the leading indicators up front with your CEO and your CFO. Mm. If you don't, the problem is they're so focused on the outcomes. And so they want sales. Maybe they want sales qualified leads. They want numbers. What happens if you get $5 million to go after a content plan and start building things out, and now you're 12 months on the line, and they don't feel it. Maybe even the leading indicators are right and you've been tracking it, but they don't feel that the outcomes are being reached. Anything that comes out of your mouth at that point is going to feel defensive and you don't realize it, but you're going to be out of a job at that point there. Mm-hmm. It may take 12 months for them to come to that decision, but that's very different than if you take the time to go slow up front and walk the CEO and the CFO through all of that before it gets down to that defensive art and everybody's bought in and you report they if it's, this is January right now, if I show them the numbers in February, they're going to be like, they don't care. You have to make them slow down in the executive meeting and go, you don't care now, but you're going to care and you need to know where we're investing money. Uh, that's a brilliant example. If I can just back up and clarify my understanding, uh, when you talk about systems, uh, are you referring to not just the ways you build out a funnel, but more fundamentally, how you're seeking to build relationships with your uh, future clients? 
Yeah, systems are much more than funnels. Systems is to me anything. If I was going to have a flow chart of how our company interacts with the with the customer from perception until they've been a loyal customer, what would go on that mind map and flow chart? Of course, a bunch of funnel things. Product is as well. Ticketing systems and how those get responded to a system. There's going to be a a support system in there for tickets, and it's important that everybody knows is your company. Care and, and there's not a right or wrong answer here, but some companies will run support as they want to close tickets as quickly as possible. I tend to take the opposite approach. I want a ticket to stay open until the customer is solved. I'd rather have one ticket that goes on for 45 days until a bug is fixed than three tickets where it's solved, solved, not solved, comes back again. So any of those interactions, the sales interactions with them, <clears throat> If you rent out Pebble Beach, I was at a company once a year or, or we, for all of our big customers, we would rent out Pebble Beach. That's part of the system of the interaction of our company with them. And, and I might have a time frame on that. And it's important for my marketers to know that they're never going to be invited to Pebble Beach, but they need to know when those things are coming up from the sales team, even if there may be a marketer or two, they're supporting a drip campaign to, to, for that event. But the content team needs to know that's th- that taking place. And it matters so much. And it's not just that your marketers this. I found you need to walk your engineers through this. And it's something that's done collectively, an approach to the systems, the, the product officer, the sales team, and the chief marketing officer should all be agreed upon what this is. Because the conversations when your head of engineering team knows what we're, the perceptions that we're up against and what content we're creating over the next 90 days to try to set expectations, it you'll... You, Everybody will find it changes the questions that team engineering lead will have with their product manager Mm -hmm. and say, wait a second, they're setting this expectation. You put this feature on there. These two things aren't aligned. What do you want me to do? That's healthy conflict. We'd much rather have that up front, but everybody has to know how are we trying to change perceptions? What promises are we making? I love recording one-on-one conversations with customers and putting that, dropping them into a Slack channel for anybody in the company to have access to. And often the engineers are quiet and then something will come up like four months later and you'll find out, wow, Brian has listened to every single recording we put in there. There's a lot to unpack there, but perhaps I could uh, ask this question as, uh, in order yeah. to make some headway. Perhaps it's the example of uh, eXp Realty or, or some other company, but could you share an example of a company that has successfully transitioned from short-term tactics to more of a strategic long-term approach and elaborate on the key factors that contributed to their success? Yeah. So kind of part of eXp actually for a little while. So I came to eXp Realty, private equity group had brought me in for a company called Showcase IDX. In the States, most of the real estate uh, listings all come from about 500 to 600 uh, data feeds around the country. So we were one of three big players, pull all of those data feeds together and, and allow an individual agent or team or broker to put those things on their website. They were, we were very focused on short-term sales. The company was struggling with burn. Let's just say when I joined, we shored that up pretty quickly and then COVID happened. Still, we grew through COVID a little bit, but we ended up selling to eXp Realty, which was great because it was almost like another capital infusion. And so we really, at that point, as opposed to just struggling for how do we get up to cash break even, we slowed down for the next 12 months and ended up being 18 months, but the plan was 12 months to... Um, make sure everybody understood what our customers, thousands of different real estate agents across 100 plus brokers and teams in the States, what were they actually trying to do with our software? And then what were they actually doing? We made sure the engineering team knew about knew it. And because what we thought, what we were selling them was great. There were some people, we had this one guy, Patrick in Nashville, he was generating 50,000 organic visitors from Google alone, not counting like being in some others, in a little market of Nashville, which is not a big market, 50,000 uh, unique visitors to his website every month. Huge, but most people weren't that. And so we, we're, we had to step back and go, some people are Patrick Higgins, but what are most people actually doing? Okay, mm-hmm. who do we want more of? Can we move people for, that aren't using the product to, to the maximum? Or are there features and, and things that we can do that are going to help these customers, which are immaculately happy. Many of those have been customers for two years and three years. If they're happy, but they're not getting the number value that Patrick is, who's right? Well, they're a customer. 
they're both happy from an NPS perspective, but we almost had to separate them into two different customers. And um, we did find a middle ground, but be, it, it was because we were able to slow down and find out how the customers were basically just getting up a very simple website. Why were they happy? Because I'm looking at it being like, well, you're not getting 50,000 unique visitors. Mm. You're not getting 5,000 unique visitors. Why are you happy? And you have to ask that in a way so that the customer doesn't churn. And, but when we did that, we were able to find out so much more about what they were doing. So you were uh, essentially able to unpack uh, the reasons why, what, what customers were looking for uh, in terms of more of a jobs to be done perspective, uh, and then feed that back into the company in terms of creating outcomes that, that they could relate to. Yes. And, and we made sure that the engineers knew what the feedback was as well. And so we, yes. because where we sat, we were able to anonymously get feedback from consumers as well from it. And that it really unpacked when we started opening up, we, we, we did segment the customers as I talked about, but we started opening the discussion with the engineering team and the product managers to say, this is the feedback that we're getting. Because mm -hmm. what I found is we always want at companies for the product managers to, to be talking to the customers as much as possible. But so often they have so much to build. If you actually go talk to most product managers, they, they spend a fraction of the time, a small fraction of the time that they want to spend with customers actually getting customer feedback. And so where marketing has a wonderful place to step in there is to say, well, we have probably more data than everybody outside of the pure product usage. What would help you? And then we're able to have those conversations, often turn them into podcasts or videos, training materials, and then siphon that over to the engineering and product management team in, to give them like synthesized summaries of stuff that they would like, but they just don't have the time to do because they're building stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, with this idea that you're uh, highlighting here, uh, would it be fair to say that you see marketing as an enabler of a better understanding of customers and vice versa of the organization, of customers understanding the organization and the people behind it and, and I guess some of the uh, challenges and, and uh, benefits of, of the organization as well. Yes, I Steve Jobs used to have a Mar uh, Apple so that there was only two people that could stop the release of a product like the day before it's supposed mm -hmm. to launch. That was Steve Jobs and anybody with a marketing title. And did that ever actually happen? I don't think so. But his push behind it was marketing's job is to understand the perceptions of the customers mm -hmm. before and afterwards. And often engineers and product, the product team, at least historically at a lot of electronic companies, weren't always that way. And so I like to approach it more of the thing of, look, my job when I walk into work every day is to serve our customers. And I know the best way to do that is usually by serving my team or my other leaders and and. I like product and sales. And so if the product managers tell me they want more customer data, but they don't have time and the customer success team says they have all this data, but they don't know what to do with it. It just goes into Zendesk or something. Okay. Our job as marketers, it's better the more data we have. Well, so I usually try taking an approach that says it's not quite the Steve Jobs approach, but to me, marketing is any interaction with a customer from before they've even heard of our brand until they've been a decades long loyal customer. And most of us aren't gonna be at our B2B brand for three, four, five years or more. And But when you take that approach, then I go, look, I don't care if customer success reports to me or reports to the to chief revenue officer. I want all of your data. I will automate things. If your team doesn't have the ability to create dashboards, we can create dashboards that your team, Mr. or Mrs. Revenue Officer, will create the dashboards for you all. I just want full access to your data. And we're all going to sit down. We're all going to share. We're not going to have a sales view of the customer and a product view of the customer and a marketing view of the customer. We're going to have one view of the customer. And I'll pull, my team will pull all of the data together and give it to everybody. And if you don't like how we're doing it, we'll change it. And when you take that approach, the product managers are like, we've been strapped for resources. We'll give you every piece of data we have. And now in some cases they have, they may have different tools and be able to use it slightly better. At eXp, we brought on a head of product management from Verizon Innovation to lead all of our consumer experience. His name is Spondin. Spondin brought in an analytics plat platform, a product analytics platform named Amplitude. I dug in there a good bit. My marketing team dug into it a good bit. Nobody understood Amplitude the way that Spondin did. So when we needed more data, Spondin's, I got it. Tell me what you need. And, but because we were all trying to get the single view of the customer. Right, 
Right. Somebody right. just has to be the somebody just has to be the coach right. that pulls it together. Certainly. So I'm curious, as you look to build out uh, a long-term strategy, and uh, from what you were saying, I gather that you're building out a playbook as well for not just the marketing team, but for everyone else within the organization to follow along with. How do you allow for changes that are taking place that seem to be increasingly taking place at an incredibly fast pace? Take SEO, for example, and this is purely hypothetical, but let's say people revert to things like chat GPT to get more precise answers as opposed to doing uh, what is traditionally done a Google search, for example. Uh, how do you deal with uh, all, all these um, future challenges to the way we do doing things that seem to be occurring at an incredible, incredible rate? Yeah, great question. I like to consider myself a mad scientist a little bit, and I mm -hmm. usually I, I enable some of my te teams to do that as well. And so I like to think about the marketing that we're doing today we want to get that set up so it's running like a mass production factory that's making cars or widgets. And content, this is our SOPs, this is our playbooks, this is how we're doing things, and we're setting up email automation, whatever we're doing. And, and I will often bring in somebody. I had a gentleman named Scott at my last company. He was my operations manager on the marketing side. Scott's job was basically, he, he did not come from a marketing background. He was a great business development person. And I was like, I, I moved him from another part of the organization. He goes, what am I going to do? And I said, you're going to be my factory foreman. I want to know that the factory is always working at 95 to hundred percent efficiency. And if something's going crazy, it's your job to raise it to me. Even though anybody come to me, I said, your job is to raise to me that this line, the, the content line is starting to have some issues and I'll come in and help and coach where I need to and um, talk mm -hmm. about things. And he's like, what are you going to be doing then? If ba I'm basically running huge portions of this team. I said, I'm over here. So to your point about SEO, I took six and a half months that just mad scientist with, with a couple of people in the industry learning semantic and topical SEO. And this was two and a half years ago when Corey was just starting to talk about it. And I'm mad scientisting stuff over there. And there, he'd ask every once in a while, he could see some of my Trello boards. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying, I'm building the next line that we're going to run into your factory. Now, my results were good enough that mm -hmm. we just completely overwrote the playbook for how we created content before. The production numbers went up by probably 8x on a monthly mm -hmm. basis from what we were doing previously. And the the uh, rankings for keywords skyrock started skyrocketing as well. I found a way to completely unlock the people's also an, uh, asked questions on, on Google, which does work very closely and match up with some of the same responses on perplexity or the generative mm -hmm. AI part of Google and stuff now or traditional search as well. So I, I tend to always mad scientist something but I want the other people on my team to be able to have time of doing that as well. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, how would you approach this mad scientist type approach? Uh, it's one thing to jump onto every single bandwagon that's new and shiny and shows uh, a little bit of promise uh, as opposed to being quite focused on the things that you pick. Uh, I'm assuming you don't have vast resources, at least most of us don't. So uh, how do you pick and choose where to invest your time and energy? Um, as much as possible, what are we going to experiment? I, I think everything in marketing, but in business as a whole, and this is a great discussion with your, for the executive team as well is what's the controlled risk we want to do. I know two public companies where I've spoken with multiple people on the C-level where the CEO came to the, everybody in the C-level and basically demanded, I want to know every department and sub department in this company. I want to know in two weeks what your AI projects are. That is not how you approach new technology, as opposed to what business outcomes are we trying to reach? What are our OKRs? Is AI applicable? What's the best risk we can do? So one of those companies is, in my mind, they are jumping into AI from a content perspective that is exposing them to an unbound risk because of the industry they're in if the content is wrong. They actually have legal liability, not even a discussion that they're having. And I was like, ooh, that's a bad thing. But when you start talking about controlled risk and we're talking about time horizons, the way we mentioned before, now we start being able to have a different discussion that says, gosh, is AI good for content generation? Yes. Could I just go generate 5,000 articles in a month? Yep. I actually know software, 10 grand a month that you can do that with. Is it going to probably be horrible for your rankings long term? Absolutely. As opposed to talking with the CEO and CFO and says, we're going to start using it. We're going to run some small experiments over here. 
to just generate a ton of things. But our goal right now is to see how do we optimize and how do we get a 15 to 30% increase in our production and quality. And, and, and then they start going, okay, they're, they're like those controlled risk discussions then give you more time to do things right and go back to what business outcomes do you want us to accomplish? And to your point, you can't do everything. There's some things I've seen AI used for. I'm like, that's awesome. I don't have time for it whatsoever. I've thankfully been playing just a little bit in the last couple of days with the text to video that uh, OpenAI just put out. But, but even when that fully gets open to everybody, most people aren't going to have time to play with it. Mm. You, you were certainly looking at this from the perspective of uh, business outcomes. If, if that sort of conversation around control, risk, uh, et cetera, needs to happen, how would you suggest we, we have this? Because it's, I would imagine it's not just a, a conversation that the leadership has as a once and done kind of thing. It's something that's ongoing and everyone needs to feel that even if it's uh, passed down, that they have the uh, parameters within which to operate safely without employing uh, incredible amounts of money or uh, putting their jobs at risk. Yeah, uh, great questions. It does start with that time horizons conversation we talked about at the beginning. When upfront, everybody is we're agreeing on the business outcomes, but we're also agreeing on how much money are we going to allocate towards trying to hit the numbers for the next two quarters versus that next frame versus longer term. We've already started, we've already separated the conversation. We've given a, a framework for conversations to have healthy conflict. So when somebody comes up and says, Hey, I just, uh, can we fire the content team so that we can just go insert chat GPT and, and go faster? Now we can go, what outcomes we're talking about. This is, we want to allocate 50% of our investment on the shorter term to make sure we hit number and 35% on the next phrase. And then this 15% out there, do you want to take the risk that we just completely blow our numbers for the next two quarters? No, I don't. Of course, no CEO is going to be like, uh -huh. they're never going to want to do it because they have to hit their numbers. So then you go, okay, but I hear that you want to see, can we either do more or can we save more money? So how, what experiments can we do? And now I'm able to, I've already got them away from, we're not firing the content team to just go pure AI for content mm -hmm. because we have to hit those numbers over the next four to six months. Now I'm, we're starting to talk about, all right, do you want me to experiment for efficiency or cost cutting? And I'm, I'm buying time for us to have a wise discussion versus an emotional discussion. Because so mm -hmm. often I, I think when leadership from anyone, anywhere comes in and they're like, hey, here's this new trend I heard about or TechCrunch is not as popular now, but we, we both were around where TechCrunch was like the thing. And man, I, I, I would leave a company like the next day if the CEO came more than two or three times. And I read this article in TechCrunch and basically they're wanting to insert that everything should get pivoted towards that direction. Sorry, we don't make product decisions. We don't make sales decisions. We don't make marketing decisions based on an article. But, I, but there's nothing wrong with having the emotion. So I want to mm. hear from people Hey, when we, when we all agreed on what the wise decisions was, let's pause. And you know, do we still agree that's a wise decision? Okay. So what do we, what, how do we ensure that we still hit our, hit, hit that wise approach? And then from the emotions, why do you care about this? Oh, you want to like most CEOs are not coming in and saying, I want to cut the content team of seven writers so that we can save money. They want to redeploy that money somewhere else whether it's in your team or somewhere else. And then you go, oh, so you want to get more out of that money. They're usually not being like, how do we just cut dollars? Hmm. So from what you're saying, I'm assuming that the you see a strong correlation between things like story, culture, relationships, and systems. Would that be fair? Very fair. I think at the end of the day, everything is a story arc. And that includes mm -hmm. our relationship, with the people that work for us and the people that we yeah. work for. And being congruent with what I've said yesterday is the most important thing that I can do today to have my team trust me, have my CEO trust me, and for the CFO to frankly write a check for something else. And that doesn't mean we can't change our mind today, but I have to be congruent with what I said and what we agreed to yesterday versus just going, that's a great idea. Let's go do that. Mm -hmm. So you're taking a very logical and, as you said, a wise approach to to agreeing on outcomes. Would you say that there's a bit more to this piece to encourage collaboration and the kind of culture that people would enjoy to work in as well? 
two things I would suggest there. One is I, I do believe in this approach of, I, it, for me, leadership fundamentally, if you really boil it down, there's only two types of leadership. There's an authoritative leadership, which says, look, if you don't do this the way that I say, how I say it, and as fast as I say, there's the door, I'm going to fire you. That's underlying authoritative leadership. Yep. And the other side is, look, I've hired you to do work. I've hired you to try to hit an outcome. And so I want, I what can I do? Because I'm not giving you more money. I've hired you for 100000 or $200,000. I've hired you to do, help them hit this business outcome. What can I possibly do today? Either resources, training, or rearranging things in the company to help you hit your business outcome. When I'm trying to do that with everybody on the company, people show up differently at the office. But that key about how they show up, what, what key to me there is I have everybody, even I've been at companies I've had to pay for this out of my own pocket. There's a communication assessment called Berkman. It's not really a personality type, but I love this approach because it, it divides up who you are in like nine different areas. And it, it says, how do you show up in meetings? How do you... Typically, what do you actually need, which is not always how you show up. I, I can make fast decisions, but the bigger the decision is, and this is, I don't always agree with Berkman, but Berkman says, I need more, to, I want more time to think about it. But I, I show up with a fast decision because we've been in these environments. It says, look, when there's a big thing, people want to start moving and that's often what they expect, but that's not actually what I want. So the third part from the Berkman is in each of these nine areas, what's the person's stress response if they don't get what they actually need in that area. Social energy is another big one. How people, to your point about collaboration, how people like pushback. I worked with the CEO, man, he was had no problem challenging you or anybody in a nice way, but in a big group. He, the, he would take the strongest criticism of his idea from me as long as I did it one-on-one. -on -one the most minor criticism of, or, or different approach to his idea in the big group. It was just like, it just triggered things in him from past bosses and this PTSD came up from him. And so Berkman just happened to be the way that we talked through that. I like it just cause it gives everybody the same terminology, but he and I disco discovered we're like, Oh, he's no, I have no problem getting feedback from you. Very different feedback. Tell me I'm wrong. He just didn't want me to do it with anybody else hearing it. And then he would, even in that meeting, he would sometimes go, if I convinced him that my approach was better, he would then go back to the whole team and say, Kurt and I had this conversation. He changed my mind. Here's what we're going to do now. He just didn't want to be challenged in person. And so everybody on your team is going to be that way. It's not as easy as introvert or extrovert. You have to dig through not just who they are, but what toxic boss have they worked through when they worked for when they were 14 or 42 that's causing this triggered emotions with them? Mm. Are there other misconceptions that you think uh, a lot of people hold? And if so, uh, what are the most common ones that you encounter and, and how can we avoid them? I think a lot of people, they shy away from the term conflict. They don't want personal mm. life. They don't want it at work. But if you look at the data, the only way you're not going to have conflict with other people is by not being in relationship with other people. And so the question is, to me then is, do you want to have healthy conflict or not? And if whatever the topic is at work, if you disagree with me, it's going to be much better for you to bring that up early versus six months down the line, because I might be wrong. And, and I'm keenly aware of there are things I'm going to be wrong at, things the CEO are going to be wrong about, because being wrong and being right feels exactly the same way until you're six months or two years down the line and you have all the data that says that was a bad, not only was that like, like a little bit off, that was a bad business decision to make, a bad marketing campaign. Well, often somebody had a gut reaction about that beforehand. And so I'd much rather create it up front that says, look, like sometimes people will bite their tongue and be like, I don't agree with that, but you're the boss. No, I, I want you to tell me you don't agree with it. There may be a case where I have to make the call and say, this is what we're going to do, but I'd much rather be challenged up front because otherwise I look at it. Um, I'm at our mountain property right now and the highest peak in Georgia in the States is just across the valley from us. And I could point to it and be like, hey, we're going to hike there tomorrow. And, and there's lots of ways we could get there. But if we come to a fork in the path and I think we should go right and you think we should go left and I force the decision and we're now two hours down the road 
and we realize, yep, I was wrong. Now there's animosity. You're like, we have a bad relation. There's more conflict at that point, And that's going to affect our future relationships. I'd much rather up front talk through, gosh, you think we should go left? I think we should go right. Okay, let's talk through why. And we're still going to have to pick. But very often what I find is when you talk that through, either one, it does both people or the team all come together and coalesce. Or those leading indicators we talk about, we identify some new leading indicators that will test so we won't have to wait six months to find out if we're wrong and we'll start looking for it earlier. And when you do that and you approach conflict rather than the way most people do and they avoid it, imagine if every bad decision your team is going to make instead of finding out in six months, if, imagine being able to find it out in 60 days. And you repeat that for three years you've now compressed like 10 years of bad mistakes to getting through them faster and getting the right ones faster. And that's how you start. That's how you start to unlock hyper growth is you create the environments where people they'll bring up ideas where they disagree with it. They feel safe bringing it up. I have for some people on my teams, I have on the agenda for one-on-ones that forces me to ask the question, Do you have a gut reaction for anything in any department that might be going wrong right now? And I just button up and I take notes for whatever the person says. And I go, thank you for sharing that. And then we'll go investigate it later. And uh, hyper growth, could you elaborate on that in in terms of what it is and how you are able to bring it about in, in B2B companies? Sure. Most B2B companies, we all want to grow. Every Most every investor, they love to invest in that, that unicorn company. It usually doesn't happen. But often, so often the reason it doesn't happen is they're doing things to focus on either the short term or they're not doing those playbooks and things that could scale. And so I've been, I've been blessed to be at two hyper growth companies. And so one of them was a company called Navtech. We took it from $85 million a year in revenue to $1.44 billion in 10 and a half years. That's not growing 15%, 25% year over year. That's like insane growth every single year. And so a couple of years were a little bit slower, but we did that by knowing that we were going to miss some opportunities, but the things that where, where we really made connections with the customers, how do we, how did we document to your point earlier about playbooks and SOPs? I hired somebody at my two companies ago, I didn't know this at the time. Her superpower was documentation. And I I will hire somebody like Mandy in every company going forward now because she allows me to go faster. I document pretty well. I love playbooks and systems, but it's, I have to slow down to do it. I could put Mandy in a zoom call for things that for a department that she wasn't in. And she could just listen to you and me talk through what we're going to go and do and what we know is working. And tomorrow she's going to give us a 27 page guide with a two page checklist up front for somebody new on board uh, to go through, but the detailed guide for the new hires and that thing. And then she can update them over time just by listening in. Oh my gosh. That when you start to get that now onboarding changes, onboarding goes from a little bit of, Hey, let's have a meeting. You shadow somebody it en- ends up instead coming to a Trello board with a column for comp- learning the company a column for your role and a column for training. Okay. So it, it, it's by hyper growth, you're, you're really com, uh, looking again at compressing some of the learnings into quick sprints, as some people call it, in, in order to ensure that you're able to surface the experiments that work well and double down on those. Double, Quincy. yeah, double down on those. And I'm, I'm forcing everybody from hyper growth. It may not happen. It often doesn't. But I'm forcing them to think, how would we respond if we had a 2000% increase in sales? Like when you start thinking about that, when you have three people on your onboarding team for B2B and you go, what would happen if sales and marketing just really got this figured out and they brought in like 200 X, the number of customers next year, what would you all do if I said you couldn't hire anybody else in the first couple of quarters, but people will freak out. And they'll say it's not possible, but then they'll go, we could automate this and we could do this. And they'll start to figure out things that it's a great thought exercise, because if you do that, say with customer success, then what happens now you've automated so much of the things that 
wasn't personal, wasn't relationship, wasn't driving real revenue. And, but some cases got them information faster, but you may do that with sales and be like, what if the marketing qualified leads I gave you went up by 2000%, what would you do differently? And so you force the entire team to think, start thinking through what would happen if, and off and what will generally happen is the entire speed of growth will at least three or four X what it has been, but it has to be a systems approach, a kind of across the entire team. Or I have been at one company where sales and marketing, we did this ourselves and we didn't tell anybody else. Nobody else was really bought in and we got sales cranking and it like, Finally, an executive meeting, they asked, what are you all trying to do? And I said, we agreed that we are going to try to break the entire DevOps environment. We want to break the servers. And they're like, you're trying to crash the system? And we're like, yep, we're trying to drive so many customers that it crashes. Wouldn't that be a wonderful, and wouldn't that be a wonderful problem if we had that much growth? And they're like, okay, now we're starting to understand things differently. <laughs> Certainly. I actually want the system to go down, yeah. but I wanted to throw so much at the AWS environment and the way they had it architected and uh, software or, and the, the, the hardware environment that if it's not optimized, it's going to break. Mm. I'm curious with this idea of correlating storytelling systems, relationships, and culture. Uh, are there perhaps an aspect or two that you find doesn't get much airtime? If so, what would they be? I think one of the things the story, uh, the storytelling story arcs is we often don't realize that sales changes the conversation that marketing is trying to set up, especially in organizations where they have inside, where they have insider or outside sales. It's different if it's a click through to buy thing. But if you have an outside sales team, if you actually just listen in on those conversations, if you can create an environment where you can, you'll find in some cases, it's not like a fundamentally different product, but it's like they've shifted the story arc two degrees or five degrees off of true north. And that's not a bad thing because they're closing deals. And I, so I find so often marketers, we think we come up with the best stories as opposed to realizing our job is not to come up with the best stories. Our job is to curate the best stories for our customers and you not use our language, use our customer's language. And, and so I think that's the big, that's one of the things. The other big piece that I think is often missing from the story arc is I found an incredible way to lower churn with the customers by going through and taking from a story arc perspective. And when you go through and you really dissect and you audit why people are churning out, it's not the product. It's the perceptions that marketing set up very early in the funnel. And we set a perception with the customers about what the story was going to be, what the value was going to be. Mm -hmm. And the product was great. And, but not everybody usually has that. And so when I realize the story that we're setting up up front affects the entire perception as the arc, it's going to people churn out at the end. And if you can get up the, if you can correct that story very much up front, you might lower your churn mm. by... Well, that's an incredible insight. Kurt, if you were listening to this episode, what would you say would be your main takeaway? I think my main takeaway is if you're... I think regardless of where you're at in the organization, more so if you're in leadership, but you need to be looking at not just how do you get promoted, not how do you do the specific job you were asked, but how do you serve the other people on your team, especially if you're higher up? But also if I'm if I'm an if I'm a individual contributor, you've asked me, you've hired me and asked me to hit an outcome. You haven't mm -hmm. hired me to do a specific thing. And so I need to be aware of that and seek to always come in with that servant's heart to be like, hey, how, how can I help us hit? How, what can I do today to help us hit those outcomes? Certainly. Uh, and for those who are curious and want to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend they head to? At two places. One would be LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn newsletter called, called Growth Matters, where I share a lot of tips like this ongoing, or my personal website. I write a lot about these topics, especially on the leadership and operations topics, which I find holds back a lot of teams. 
Okay, we'll include links to that in the show notes. Kurt, this has been brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you.